15. Sir Aubrey had sent the carriage to the station. He himself was going to wait for his grandson in the drawing room. If it was his grandson. Clovis sat behind, between Mr Trapwood and Mr Lowe. The crows were going to hand him over personally before returning to town. It was cool. It was, in fact, very cool, with an east wind blowing off westward more, and Clovis drank in the air with relief. No sticky heat and no insects. He was in England at last. They had driven for at least 20 minutes down an avenue of lime trees. Clovis could see the glimmer of water between the coppices. That must be the lake where the basher had held Bernard's head under water. Then, suddenly, the carriage curved round the bend and westward lay before him. It was exactly as Finn had described it. An east wing, a west wing and a block in the middle. But it was very large. Larger than he could ever have been able to imagine. For a moment, Clovis found his stomach lurching. The crows were easy, easy to hoodwink. They had fawned on him all through the journey and spent their spare time in the bar. But Finn's grandfather would see through him. He was sure of that. They passed the fountain with the person on it who was strangling a snake. He seemed to have lost his head, which was a pity. Then the carriage stopped outside the main entrance and Clovis saw a crowd of people massed on the stone steps which led to the front door. There was a woman in blue aprons, women in black dresses, men in livery and overalls and tailcoats. Of course, the servants all lined up to greet him. Clovis's panic grew worse. He hadn't realised that there could be so many servants in the world. Then he remembered that this had happened in Little Lord Fauntleroy when Seddy arrived from America and in a play called The Young Master when the lost heir returned to his home. The coachman opened the door. Mr Lowe and Mr Trapwood waited respectfully for him to get out first. Clovis squared his shoulders. He took a deep breath as he had always done before he went on stage and he moved forwards. And upstairs in the drawing room Sir Aubrey put his telescope to his eye. When the boat docked at Liverpool, the crows had stopped at a gentleman's outfitters and bought a tweed suit and a cap for Clovis, the best that the shop could supply. Now, as he peered through the eyepiece, Sir Aubrey saw a handsome lad, blue-eyed and sturdy, who carried himself like a prince. The boy shook hands with the butler, the housekeeper and the cook, exactly as he should have done. Then, at the top of the steps, he turned and thanked the lesser servants for their welcome before following the butler into the house and Sir Aubrey's heart leapt. He had been worried, no good denying it. Bernard might not have produced anything, but this boy looked splendid. He would not chatter to the servants as his father had done. He was gracious, but he kept his distance. In the hall, the steward waited to show Mr Lowe and Mr Trapwood into the office. The crows had hoped to be asked to stay for, to supper, but Sir Aubrey did not dine with detectives. However, they were paid off and got their bonus, along with a glass of beer before they said goodbye to Clovis and were driven back to the station for the London train. The butler, who was not the old one who had sacked Bella, but a younger man with black hair, locked Bernard. Uh, uh, now led Clovis back past the chest into which Dudley had locked Bernard, past the knight in armour out of which Dudley had jumped, and the picture of the man with the Turk's head impaled on a lance. Then he knocked on a heavy oaken door, announced, Master Taverner, Sir Aubrey, and withdrew. Over what seemed like acres and acres of rich dark carpet, Clovis looked at Sir Aubrey Taverner, and Sir Aubrey Taverner looked at him. Clovis saw a stout red-faced man with a white moustache and bushy eyebrows. He was leaning on a stick, so Clovis thought he must have gout. Everyone older than 50 seemed to have gout in the sort of plays Clovis had acted in, and he decided to be very careful and not bump into him. Sir Aubrey, on the other hand, saw the grandson of his dreams. Clovis's eyes were very blue, his hair was thick and golden. He bowed low over the hand stretched out to him. The Goodleys had been very keen on proper bowing. Well, my boy, here you are at last. What made you hide away for so long? Clovis had thought of the answer to this one. Because I was afraid I was not worthy to fulfil my role. He looked at Sir Aubrey to see if he had overdone it, but he hadn't. Nonsense, you'll learn, boy, my boy. And then... You're not at all like your father, not at all. I believe I take after my mother, sir, said Clovis. Since he had never seen his mother, who had dumped him in an orphanage as soon as he was born, he felt quite sure in saying this. All the same, you remind me of someone. Now, who can it be? Clovis waited nervously. Then, I know, said Sir Aubrey. Yes, your great-great-uncle Alwyn. He was an admiral in Nelson's navy. Went down with his ship at the Battle of the Nile. There's a portrait of him in the gallery. I'll show it to you later. 
Clovis then asked what had happened to the head of the man who was strangling a snake, and Sir Aubrey said that Dudley had blasted it with his shotgun. He was after some poachers, he said, and fell silent, looking very sad. Splendid chap, Dudley. Ask anyone. Clovis said that he had heard from his father how strong Dudley was, and tried to think if he had heard anything nice about Dudley, but he hadn't. Fortunately, Sir Aubrey was looking very upset. The butler announced Mrs Smith and her three da older daughters. The youngest daughter, Prudence, was still in nappies and did not go out to dinner. Again, Clovis had no difficulty in recognising Mrs Smith as the basher, and her daughters as the ones who were no use to Sir Aubrey because they were the wrong sex. How do you do, Aunt Joan? said Clovis, smiling and hoping that the basher had settled down since her marriage. Well, you led us quite a dance, brayed Joan, and introduced her daughters. The girls were very thin and frail, and with straight fair hair and expressions like banshees. Hope, who was eleven, had buck teeth. Faith, who was nine, had trouble breathing through her nose. And Charity was so frightened of her mother that she stammered. But they were ni all nice girls all the same. All three of them looked anxiously at Clovis. Their mother had said that one of them would have to marry him when they grew up so that their family could get a share of Westwood. The girls knew that Bernard had been mad and had run away from home and talked to housemaids and to rats, so the idea of marrying his son made them feel very frightened. But now, as Clovis smiled and shook hands with them, they felt better. He did not look like a boy who ran away from home and talked to housemaids. The butler now announced that dinner was served. Clovis offered his arm to the basher, which he knew was correct because of all the plays with dinner parties that he had acted in, and they crossed the gallery and went down the great carved stairway to the dining room. As soon as he saw the table with its snow-white cloth and smelled the faint warm smell of fresh rolls and roasting meat, Clovis knew it was going to be all right. He remembered the Hotel Paradiso and all the other places where he had eaten vile food and a smile which made his face look very beautiful passed over him. Even his foster mother couldn't have cooked a better meal. The asparagus soup was delicate and creamy, the roast beef was brown and crisp on the outside and just a little pink in the middle and the potatoes melted in the mouth. And for dessert, they had bread and butter pudding with dollops of cream. Clovis ate, and as he did so, he decided he could probably hold out for a week, or even two, before he gave himself up. Finn would be glad for the extra time, and it would be a, it would be a pity not to stay for the other things. Ginger pudding, boiled mutton with capers, perhaps, and there'd be proper crackling on the pork. As for the little banshees, when they returned home, they, were too, they too were satisfied. I wouldn't mind marrying him, said the eldest hope. I wouldn't either, said Faith. Nor me, said Charity. I w wouldn't mind too. Then they sighed. Mother will tell us which one it's going to be, said Hope, as long as it's not Prudence. Prudence was still in nappies and far too small to be in the running, but she had curls and a dimple and her sisters hated her. As for Clovis, he lay freshly bathed in a linen nightsheet between cool and spotless sheets. No mosquito netting, no fly paper, no beetles. Yes, he would definitely hold out for at least a week. He had promised Finn and he would do it. But Sir Aubrey was not yet in bed. He had limped up to the picture gallery at the top of the house and stood for the first for a long time, looking at the portrait of Alwyn Taverner in his naval uniform. Really, the likeness was extraordinary. The nose, the eyes, the mouth, the way his hair fell over his forehead. All of it was the same as if the boy who had come today. It has happened sometimes that a likeness skipped a few generations and then showed up stronger than ever, thought Sir Aubrey. That was the amazing thing about the blood.